New Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger has come out hot since taking over the top job in February. The company is saying it will continue to make its own chips and invest $20 billion to help further those efforts. Intel's new CEO, Pat Gelsinger, joins us now. Pat, good to speak with you here. Uh, I would say this, this announcement of a $20 billion investment to increase your capacity, it surprised a few folks on Wall Street. Why that amount and why now? Well, uh, you know, when we think about the world situation today, there's an extraordinary demand for semiconductors, right? As we've seen, basically, the world is becoming more digital. Every aspect of that runs in semiconductors. And then COVID put us into a higher gear, right? It just accelerated, you know, remote work, remote education, telemedicine, automotive. You know, all of these are now seeing the shortages of semiconductors. So the world needs more of these capabilities. Also, the world wants a more balanced supply chain. There's an extraordinary concentration in Asia, right? So US and Europe, and we're one of the few companies that can step into that. And we've also seen that our own supply right, situation, wow, you know, the demand signal is just off the charts. So we wanna step into that in an aggressive way. And the fastest way that we could expand our capacity was at a site that we were already at, was in Arizona. So we announced two new fabs, 10 billion a piece, right? You know, so, right, you know, maybe, maybe there's a shopper uh, a discount when you do them two at a time. But, uh, you know, also that we announced that we'll have our next major locations in US and in Europe that we expect to announce within the next year as well. So it's 20 billion and more to come. Now, what's, what do you say to the critics uh, of Intel that they have seen Intel try to do things like this before? This is a, a costly endeavor. What do you say to them today? Well, first, it's a great market, $100 billion, very profitable market that the world wants dramatically more of, right? You know, the world is a different place today. And some of these international requirements, balanced supply chains, we're uniquely positioned to go do that. Some of our past attempts in the foundry space, I'd say, have been somewhat half-hearted, right? This is going to be a business unit reporting to me, clear accountability, separate P&L, dedicated capacity. You know, we're throwing the teams, the resources, the talent to make it successful. Also, we're making the best of Intel available for the foundry business. You know, we're making our best process, our unique advantages in 3D packaging, the full gamut of our intellectual property available, including x86 cores, you know, the heart of our uh, business uh, today. And many of our biggest customers are saying, yes, please. Because imagine a cloud vendor who's running 10 million cores. And he says, boy, I want a little bit less of this and a little bit more of that, and I can be better optimized, and maybe I'll throw in some of my own unique IP. Wow. You know, this is game changing for them if we can start to create some of those efficiencies at scale. So for all of those reasons, we say the market is different. Our strategy is very refined. We've learned from some of those issues in the past and we are going aggressively into this uh, space. And the response, as you saw from yesterday's announcement from you know, customers and industries was overwhelmingly positive. And we've yet to deliver, right? You know, and it, you know, just saying, please, you know, make this happen rapidly. The likes, there's been so much attention on how much uh, one of your rivals, Taiwan Semiconductor, is in fact spending. If I have a correct, $28 billion this year on CapEx. At one point, does Intel pull even with them? Are, are you, how, when do you start closing that competitive gap? Yeah, you know, I don't think it's a, you know, right, you know, it's not a CapEx race in that sense. It's about how you build the overall uh, factory uh, network. And we'll say this 20 billion that we're investing this year, the commitment of 20 billion in these fabs, you know, this is a, a, a large capital gain and we're ready to go make those investments. Clearly the financial community wants to understand that, but at a hundred billion dollar market by 2025, yes, this is a market that needs investments. It is a big market and we're ready to step forward in a meaningful way. Later on this year, we'll have a financial analyst conference where I'll give a multi-year outlook uh, to our capital spend cycle as we go into this uh, business area. But it's a good business. We're one of the few companies on the planet and the only U.S. and Western-based company that can really step into this in a big way. And that's exactly what we're going to do. How far away do you think we are from uh, moving beyond the chip shortage? You know, I think it takes a couple of years, right? Because, you know, sort of what happened was COVID caused people to hold back and COVID caused digital acceleration to need more. And so essentially you had exactly the wrong business dynamics happen versus the market signal. And that's caused some delay for the industry, 
and gaps for the industry. You can't build fabs overnight, right? It takes a couple of years to get it built up. That said, you know, we're stepping into this aggressively immediately. We have some foundry offerings that we have available today. I've asked our team to immediately look at stepping up and starting to help the auto shortage and some of these other uh, gaps more uh, rapidly. And, you know, I'll say everybody in, you know, if they're in a factory for Intel, it's seven by 24, we're going faster to help close those gaps. But I really do think it takes a couple of years. It just is that long to establish new capacity. Do you view it as a as a national security risk that, that China is investing so much in its ship supply and we are still having a, a shortage here in the US? It's impacting cars demand, it's impacting notebook computers. I know you raised your guidance in the first quarter, but still we, we are starting to see to see shortages. Yeah, you know, there's a supply challenge for the industry, right? And different component parts, different things. The the demand has just surged so quickly that we're seeing that across all of the industry segments. Now, within that, uh, obviously, the uh, you know, issues of, I'll say, geographic balance do become a key consideration. And that's exactly why we've laid out the strategy, because far too much of the supply and manufacturing is, sits in a few countries in Asia. And we do see that we have to have a more balanced supply chain, where today only 15% in the US and only 5% of that supply is done in Europe. And we're going to step in and start to change that trajectory immediately. Now, we put our chips on the table. <laughs> we're putting these investments in place without a penny of commitments from states or governments, but we're ready to be meaningfully accelerated by their help. And the CHIP Act that's today being uh, discussed for funding uh, by uh, the administration and Congress, there are European uh, accelerations that the EU is putting on the table. We are ready to go faster and look forward to their help to go bigger and faster to make these gaps, to rebalance the supply chain, because it's the right thing for the nation, the right thing for the world, you know, the right thing for the industry. I know you have a lot on your plate. I mean, you just took over the, the top job here at Intel, but have you had a chance to talk with President Biden about the CHIP Act? He's putting forward a potential $37 billion in funding to help the, uh, help the chip shortage. You know, I've talked to several members of the administration, several uh, people you know, on his uh, team, uh, and uh, quite to quite a few senators and representatives at this point, also members of the defense community as well. You know, strong support in that direction. And yesterday's announcement, we had Secretary of Commerce Romando uh, participating with us formally and speaking on behalf of the president. So, so far, I think that our announcements yesterday are superbly aligned with those of the administration. So we expect those will come together very nicely over the course of this year. Is, is a $37 billion investment, is that a game changer for the, for the semiconductor industry? You know, it's a major, major statement uh, by the administration. And if that gets fully funded, fully supported, there's strong support across the semiconductor industry. You know, in fact, we have a meeting of the Semiconductor Industry Association today. Uh, they met with the uh, Commerce Secretary last week, as well as with a uh, Cyber uh, 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 Secretary. So all of these, I think, are coming together very nicely. I'd also say there's a 52 billion uh, set of incentives that have been put aside in the EU uh, as well in a very similar vein. So these are very serious statements on the parts of governments. And now to see them fully funded, you know, move forward rapidly, good bipartisan support uh, for it. You know, everything, the winds are blowing in the right direction. Our strategy that we announced yesterday is simply to you know, align with those directions in a very substantial way. You know, switching gears a bit back to your, your to your business, you mentioned on the on the conference call you held uh, on Tuesday evening, you are open to pursuing uh, opportunities with Apple. What is what is the status of your relationship with Apple right now? Well, you know, clearly, you know, there's aspects of the relationship that have become a bit more competitive, and I'll say what we're doing is to work with Microsoft, HP, Dell, and Lenovo to I'll say bring energy to the PC ecosystem because we're innovating, we're proud of it. And in COVID, the world has need more, needed more of it. And so obviously you've seen some of those competitive energies resume because there's a lot of great innovation to be done. And we haven't seen PC demand this at this level for a decade and a half. The world needs more of that. And you know, there's a bit of competitive fun going on with the Apple and the Mac ecosystem uh, as a result. At the same time, Apple's a customer 
and I hope to make them a big Foundry customer because today they're wholly dependent on TSMC. And we want to present great options for them to leverage our Foundry services as well, just like we're working with Qualcomm's, NVIDIA's, and Microsoft's, and others. You know, leverage us as a Foundry because we're going to be delivering great technology, some things that can't be done anywhere else in the world. And as we talked about, for instance, the system unpackaged technologies that we have years ahead of what anybody else can offer. And we're ready to combine other foundry technologies with our packaging and our foundry capabilities to, to enable our customers with the best products in every category. And hopefully Apple becomes a customer along with many others participating because it's the right thing for the industry, the right thing for the world. Have you had a chance, have you talked to Apple CEO Tim Cook and, and told him, hey, we want your business back. This is what we're going to do. And do you think you could win back a, a good chunk of that business over the next 18 to 24 months? Yeah, you know, we've certainly said that to Apple. I've talked to Tim and Microsoft and Qualcomm and Jensen and so on. You know, we're very much interested in winning their business, building their confidence, building their trust, and really having them know that we have world-class technologies that they can take advantage of for their business as well. So for those not too familiar with you, Pat, um, yesterday on the, on the conference, you, you sound as if uh, you've been at Intel, you, you never left. You, you joined the company <laughs> at 18, and when you did leave to take the, the CEO role at, at VMware, uh, you, I mean, you, you, were, you were the first chief technology officer at, at Intel. You know, what does it mean for you to go back to the company where you started it and try to get it through some of these big challenges? Well, I consider it, uh... As I say, I, I learned at the feet. I was mentored by Grove, the, the founders, and you know, there's such deep emotional connections there. Also, 30 years, you know, as we joke inside of the company, you bleed Intel blue, and there's still a lot of Intel blue in these veins. But it also is an opportunity to restore one of the most iconic, important customers in a critical phase of the industry. You know, this is an opportunity, maybe uh, an honor, an obligation for the company, for our industry, for our nation and the world. So I trade it almost as a holy calling, uh, if you could, to this role. You know, when I was a young person here, I made the statement I wanted to be CEO of Intel, not even knowing what I was saying at the time. Now it's become this passion, and as I've described it, the dream job that I could be part of this great iconic company. You know, I've followed your career for, for some time, Pat. How, how has faith helped change or shape your, your leadership? Well, when, when I left the company 11 years ago, you know, somewhat I was pushed out of the company. And, you know, it was hard. And, uh, you know, there's this biblical phrase that's uh, what was meant for evil worked out for good. And boy, you know, it hurt at the time. It was difficult, but it made me better. And my 11-year vacation, as I call it, I've become a seasoned, tenured CEO. I've learned new leadership skills, new customer focus, new f emphasis on diversity, inclusion, and what it means to build a uh, culture, how to work with finance in the street, depth and software. All of these things I'm now bringing back and combining with that 30 year experience that I had here. And I'll say every neural pattern that I've ever exercised is being used fully every day on the job at Intel, it's exhilarating, you know, it's a great honor. And to join with the 110,000 other talented souls that are part of this great iconic firm, you know, it really is, uh, you know, an extraordinary uh, opportunity that I've been given to come back and play this role. Well, we, we do wish you well on your journey and in, in turning Intel around. Uh, Intel CEO, Pat Gelsinger, good to see you, stay safe, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Brian.